welcome to this is a to, to the lecture series by Professor Chinese uh, Xi Peter. Uh, this is a fix of uh, the five lecture series uh, uh, given by him. Uh, so I guess I need to introduce <laughs> again. Uh, so let's uh, let, let him uh, start his lecture. Okay. So welcome to the to, to my last lecture today. Um, and so um, on Friday, we, um, we, we stopped at uh, this, this convergence result for the, for the network estimators. And I just want to, in the first uh, three, four minutes, I, I just want to hear, rehearse the, 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 the setting and, and then discuss the, the implications of the, of the theorem. So that's, that's ma mainly the, the, the outline for today. So we first talk ag again about the statistical risk bounds. Um, and then in the second part of the lecture, I want to talk about um, how these results compare to other theoretical results that you can achieve for other uh, well-known methods in, in, in non-parametric statistics slash uh, machine learning. And then the final part of the lecture, I, yeah, so, so there will be some, some ideas about uh, the theory for, for the energy landscape. Um, OK, so let me start with, again with this uh, statistical estimation risks. And uh, the, the, the model that we discussed was just the, 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 the standard non-parametric uh, regression model with, with random design. And um, so that means we, we observe NIID copies with um, uh, XIs being uh, random vectors uh, of uh, dimension D, and the YIs are the, the corresponding outputs. And the, the model just puts somehow the, um, you know, what the input output relationship is. It says somehow the, the outputs are. Uh, the inputs apply to an unknown function f plus some some Gaussian additive noise. And the problem in this model, what I explained last last Friday, is we want to we want to recover the function f from the data. And so then we mentioned so so what is now and what do we consider as an as a network estimator? Well, a network estimator is any estimator that that takes that takes the data and has uh, outputs uh, a network in, in this class um, indexed by the depth L, the width vector P, and the sparsity S. So that means we we have to fix, as in practice, we have to fix a network architecture given by a, a depth and a width of the network, and then we have an additional so yeah, sort of regularization constraints that we say, well, the, the network might, be, might have more parameters than our sample size, but there's a, a, most of these parameters are, are, are zero, and only S of them, or at most S of them, are, are the non-zero ones. Uh, and we don't know where, where in the network they are, and, and that defines this, this class. Okay? So it's just an estimator that returns a sparse a sparse network. And we measure then the, the risk and with respect to the uh, prediction and uh, the loss. Um, and um, we are interested in the decay of the, the loss in terms of the um, dependence on, on the sample size on the sample size n. Um, and then what we what we said is that well we can just look at plain uh, um, smoothness assumption on on the regression function, but here in this context it's maybe more interesting to do something else, which is where the say the intrinsic function class for for these neural networks. So if you consider, for instance, wavelets, then the the underlying somehow the oh, maxi set or whatever you want uh, to, to 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 look at it. Somehow the underlying space for, for wavelets are, are base of spaces. They're very uh, natural because they somehow convert the decay of the wavelet coefficients into the, the, the smoothness. And if we look at networks, 
uh, we should look also maybe at the, at the space of, of functions that are natural for these networks. And that's just an assumption that we make on this on the regression function. It has nothing to do with networks, but it's somehow a natural thing to, to study this function class if we think about reconstruction by networks. And the class that we consider is that the, the regression function itself can be written as a composition of q plus 1 functions. And these functions, they ju just map, say, from r to the uh, uh, di to uh, the r to the di plus 1, where di are just some, some numbers. And the thing is that, um, in principle, each component of, of this function gi can depend on di variables, but we make this additional constraint that it will only depend on ti variables, which gives us more flexibility. And the ti is a very important quantity, which is somehow a low dimensional object, which will then appear in the rate. And that can be, ti can be for instance, much smaller than, than the di. And that's, then we can see that we can save in terms of the, the curse of dimensionality. Another key quantity is the, the effective smoothness, which is the smoothness that, so we put a smoothness beta i on g i, okay, so say Hilda smoothness, um, and then we study the, the induced smoothness on, on the f essentially, and that is what the beta i star does. So that's the, what we call then the effective smoothness. And everything later will just depend you, on the only thing you have to remember from that is the, the, the these pairs t i beta i star, that is what determines uh, the rate and everything. Um, okay, so in the Q, it's, again, it's very important to see the it's just an assumption that is independent of network. So Q is not the same as, as the network depth or so. Even as, if Q is zero, you will see the depth of the network. Now in the next theorem, the depth of the network will be uh, log n. But before I come to that, because uh, last week someone had a very good question and said, so how, how can that be? So you say that each of these GIs is only allowed to depend on TI variables why don't we then must have then also t uh, here a, a ti and not a di? And so this is, an, this is an example of such a function. So suppose you can write your function. Um, so it's a function that depends on three variables. But suppose it has a, has, can be written in this form that it's um, g11, one, one, say, applied to two other uh, functions. And they only depend, each of these interior functions only depends on one variable, but it doesn't need to be always the same variable. It can be different variable. So what does that mean now in terms of these uh, di's and ti's? So the, the g0 has, is a function that maps from, um, has, uh, yeah, so it maps from r to the 3 um, to r to the 2. So the d0 is 3, but because these these functions only, each of these components only depends on one variable each. We have that the t0 is 1, so the t0 is, is, is smaller than the d0 in this case. And this outer thing, uh, so the t11, which corresponds to the net part, here is the, the t1, it's, it just depends on everything which is, comes out of the g0, so t1 is equal to, to the d1. I hope you, you understand it now better. Um, okay, so now we get uh, to the result, and the result says, uh, first of all, it says, well, you should take the network depth, you should scale it with, with log of the sample size. Um, that's, an, that's an assumption under which you can then derive the, 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 the rate. And the second assumption is that the, the width of the network, um, the width of the network that should be large, there's no upper bound for that, um, and it should be at least um, this quantity. So, so you see a quantity here that is a, a power of n and it depends on these ti's and beta i stars from, uh, from, from the slide I have shown you before. Um, and all what it says is how just make your network wide enough. Okay, so then, then, then it's fine. The, the crucial thing in the, in the, that, um, in, in the assumptions is that the, the sparsity of the network the, which somehow is, is a sort of proxy for, for the regularization that is induced by the algorithm. So, uh, that has to be really uh, taken of the exact right order. Okay, so here for the, for the network sparsity, here we really need uh, the, 
that this is taken off of that order in the assumptions in order that we can then state that the prediction error is bounded from above and below um, by, by two terms and, and, and so, so in the upper bound we lose something like log to the power 3. I, I just ignored that in, in, in this formulation here to, because I don't want to uh, confuse anyone. So, so just think about this as being like of this and, uh, order. And there are two terms here. The first term corresponds to um, the, the quality of the method. Okay, so that just tells us how good the method is in, uh, in comparison to the empirical risk minimizer, uh, which achieves the, the, global, uh, the, the, the global minimum in, 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 in this energy landscape. And so if we, so this is the, the loss that all these gradient descent methods that try to minimize the, the, the cost entropy loss and for, for regression with Gaussian errors, the cost entropy loss is the loss induced by the log likelihood and this is the, 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 the least squares loss. Okay, so that's what these methods try to minimize and the, the, the result tell you, well, if, if they manage to minimize that uh, coming close to the global minimum, the delta n will be small and will not play a role. If the delta n is large, if you have a bad minimizer, for instance, a bad local minimum, then the, it can, it can uh, uh, dominate the, the, the prediction error, right? This is an upper and, and lower bound. And uh, the second part of the rate is the, the phi n, and phi n here is this rate, which is the statistical estimation rate. It's also the optimal estimation rate that you can achieve over this class. So therefore, it's also a, a lower bound. So you can show that this is the minimax estimation rate. No method can have a, a faster rate than that. Um, and that means if the delta n is small, for instance, if you're close to the global minimum, then it's, uh, this, this will not occur here, right? And then yeah, it will be dominated by the, uh, by the phi n. And then in this case, the, the, the network uh, estimator is an optimal statistical procedure in, in terms of estimation rates. Okay, so let me uh, give you some discussion. Um, first of all, the, uh, what, what the result tells you is that in the setup, the empirical risk minimizer is, is uh, optimal, right? Because it, it makes the delta n to be zero and then somehow it has the optimal estimation rate. So that's a, that's a great thing to have that. Um, but unfortunately, it's not, not uh, computationally feasible. Another thing is that this is uh, it's a high dimensional uh, problem here. Okay, so we have potentially many, many variables, right? So there's, um, there's no upper bound on the width. Okay, so there can be e to the e to the e to the n many variables in the network, right? So that's um, much more high dimensional than, than normally we, um, the, the, the high dimensionality of of other problems that we that we consider. Okay, so there's absolutely no constraint on the upper bound here in, in terms of the network width. Um, and why is that the case? Why, why, why do we have that? The, the thing is that if by imposing network sparsity, um, we somehow restrict the number of functions that we can generate with those networks and additional width doesn't contribute anything more up, up, after a certain uh, 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 after a certain polynomial order in, in, in the sample size n. Okay, so therefore the, the, the function space that we generate is, doesn't become larger anymore, and so therefore we don't need an, an, an upper bound here. Um, and uh, the important thing here is, is really that uh, somehow the, the, the way the signal can flow through the network, uh, which is here bounded by the, by the network sparsity, this is really the essential bit. And that is also what people see in, in, in practice. So I think we have been talking about this earlier. If you, people observe and the, that the deep networks, they don't perform well if you make them too, too, too small because then you somehow, they're they not flexible enough in order to approximate. Um, but if you make them too wide, you, you don't really lose in, in terms of performance, okay? So there's at some point you get some sort of saturation. It doesn't become better more if you make your network architecture even wider or um, it, it, uh, it doesn't really matter and you don't lose um, by, by, 
uh, yeah, be be because it's somehow the, the the algorithms people use that that induces, of course, also uh, some some regularization. Uh, another thing is that this uh, you can wonder is now uh, the, the the network depth. Um, should I take that to be log n, or is that a natural thing, or is that an artificial thing from the proof? Um, it, it appears somehow naturally in the proofs. Okay, so what we have seen before is we have seen that you can, by adding one layer, you can double somehow the number of linear pieces. Okay, so and if you now think about log n layers, you can somehow with log n layers, if you start with one with one unit, or say two units, and you you you, you use this construction with log n layer you can generate something like of a polynomial order in, 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 in n. Okay, so and there, th that's why it, where it comes from. It's just uh, this type, sort of doubling property and log n is then of course a very natural thing. Um, one interesting implication is then that this uh, indeed scales with, with the sample size. Okay, so we understand maybe a bit more that if we have um, what, what one could do in practice, for instance, suppose you have fitted a, a perfect network for, for your sample and now someone else comes and gives you a much larger sample. It gives you, I don't know, um, uh, 10,000 times the, the amount of data you had before. And then you could think, okay, so I just feed that into the network I have been using before with the same architecture or should I take a different architecture? And the, the result here tells you maybe if you have more data, Right, you should take a, a, a deeper architecture because that is uh, that, that there is some sort of interaction between the depth of the network and, and the sample size. And the, you can even wonder whether the, the deep networks is just a sort of a, a big data phenomenon, right? Because we have a lot of data, we should take uh, the, the deep networks become natural. Um, okay, so another thing which is maybe interesting for uh, for people in, in non-parametric statistics, at least I was surprised to, to see that, is you see if we, if we take a function class, um, say, um, say piecewise constant function class, how wavelets or so to, to reconstruct a signal, then if we are, if the true signal is more than once differentiable, uh, say it's twice or three times differentiable, then we don't get to optimal rates anymore with approximating the function with high wavelets because these high wavelets they are not flexible enough in to, to do that. Okay, and the same happens if you take a, a function class for approximation which is consists of piecewise linear functions. Then you have a similar phenomenon and that occurs at at smoothness too. So if the function is up to twice differentiable, somehow you get optimal rates. For instance, if you take piecewise linear splines or so, but if the function is more than Price differentiable, you don't get the optimal rates anymore. And if you look at this result that we have, there is no, you don't see any upper bound on the, on the say, beta i star, so, so that can be 10 or 20, and it still gives you this weight. Although the, 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 the value networks that we use here for this result, they, they produce piecewise linear functions in the input. Okay, So they are piecewise linear, but you don't have the saturation phenomenon that you can only go to twice differentiable functions with optimal rate, and then you, you lose. Here it just works for all, for all uh, smoothness indices. And that is, has to do with the, again, with the same fact uh, uh, that we discussed last Friday, that you can, with very few parameters, you can, you can um, somehow generate these highly oscillating functions, and then you can use them in order to approximate smooth functions in a very efficient way. Okay, so yeah, the, the thing why it doesn't work for other um, for other piecewise linear function systems is that the, the way you decode the piecewise linear function system is that every piece has one parameter, but here the way you encode uh, the piecewise linear function is that with one with a few parameters you can generate functions that are piecewise linear and, and have a lot of pieces. Okay, and again this is if you then trace that MIG into where does that come from? This comes essentially from these way of stacking um, parameters on top of each other and, and um, putting these, these non-linearity in the, in the function class. Um, okay, so here's an example for what you can achieve. So what you can do actually, so uh, with, this, with this general framework, 
um, you can you can get uh, the convergence rates for many specific uh, function classes of, uh, that that has been have been considered in in the literature. Um, and one uh, the, the simplest one um, are additive models, and an additive model is just you assume that your uh, true underlying function uh, can be decomposed as um, d functions where each of these functions just depends on one of the, the variables. Okay, so it's a function f1 depending only on x1 and then you just add them uh, at, uh, until some function fd that only depends on xd. And the the, the functions fi are supposed to be beta smooth in, in Hilda's sense, or if you don't know Hilda's space, just assume it's, it's beta times differentiable. Um, and now we can put it into our, into our setup by just saying, well, I can write f, I can write it also as a composition of two functions, namely a composition of g1 with g0, where g0 is, is the function that just takes the, the, the whole input x and it maps from rd to rd and it returns a vector which just says this component has these these uh, function values okay and the g1 the, the outer function here the g1 is not uh, a very simple function it just adds all the all the the, the 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 entries okay so if you compose g1 with g0 you just see somehow you get exactly the spec so why should we do that? Well, we can, because then we get, we, we, we get to see the, the, the fast rates if we decompose it in that form. So um, if you now remember what all these d's and t's are, so the d0, because it's a function, g0 is a function from r uh, to the d, so the g0 is d, but all of these component functions just depend on one variable. That means the t0, the t0 is just one, so it's much smaller than the d. Okay, and here the second, in the second function, we have a function that maps from R D to to R, so that means the D one is is D, and it also depends on all of these um, components. So T one is also D. Um, here the but but so why does that in, in that yeah? So you could say well okay so here's the the curse of dimensionality, but it doesn't matter because this is a smooth function. So if you have a smooth function, the curse of dimensionality. Um, doesn't matter, and smooth means um, you, you can differentiate it as, as, as often as you like. Um, so if you now stick in these, these TIs and, and the beta, and then you compute everything, you see that the, the rate that you get, and for, okay, if you like, you can forget this part, yeah? So suppose you take the risk minimizer, then this will be zero, and then you get the rate is n to the minus two beta over two beta plus one, and up to the this, factor which is somehow an artifact of the proof. And so you don't see here the, the D, you see the, the, the T0 essentially, and that um, shows that you, for the additive model, you can achieve the fast rates, and those rates are of course, of course are unknown. It's just a way as a, somehow a special case of the, of the composition framework that we have been uh, proposing. Um, and, and you can do play this for many other constraints. For general, uh, gen, uh, generalized additive models, you can do that. Then you have to add another function, so g2 composed with g1, g0, and you get essentially similar rates. But already for generative, uh, sorry, for general additive models, we found some rates that we couldn't find earlier in the in the literature. And because you also have the, the lower bounds, you also know what the, the the minimax rates are in those in those cases. As a certain, because you have an outer function and then the, the smoothness of, of the outer and the inter, inner function, they, they interact in a, in a certain way. And there are many also new parameter spaces that you can express in, in such a form. For instance, you can write, if you, su suppose you can, you can write your function f, your regression function, you can write it as a, as a, as a, a linear combination of a few coefficients with respect to a tensorized uh, orthonormal basis or so. And then you can also see that in those cases, you get fast rates. And you don't need to know the basis, right? So this, the whole thing in this result is 
you just need to know that there is such a decomposition. You don't need to know the, comp the you're also not interested in estimation of G1 or G0. You just impose that as an additional structure into your, in, in your model um, that, that, that you know somehow, maybe, or if, say you can also, in a sense it's also uniform over all comp uh, 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 representations of, of, of that form. <coughs> Okay, so now on the on the proof. The proof is um, for the statistical bit um, follows some uh, classical ideas, and uh, Vladimir is an, he's an expert for these for these Oracle inequalities, and have, we have been looking a lot in his in his papers. And essentially, what you what you do is you you bound uh, the, the this prediction risk. You bound that um, by <coughs> By the, 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 the approximation error plus something that accounts for the for the variability of the estimator and that is expressed by by the the the, 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 the covering entropy, which is the, the log of the number of of points that you need to to cover the space uh, with some say epsilon distance, and epsilon n has to or epsilon has to be also some sequence, um, and second. Um, um, yeah, so, so, so then once we have established that, we know a lot already about the approximation properties and we just have to evaluate then essentially the, 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 the size of the, the, the discovering entropy and something what you can do here, here's a log n missing, so that should be another, another log n. What you, can, what you can do is you can bound the, the log entropy we have seen before that in, right, it's a similar approach than in, than in Barron's result. And in Barron's result, uh, the log entropy was bounded by the number of parameters in your in your model times the times log n. And here it's a bit similar, right? The, the number of active or non-zero parameters is, is s, and then we get s times log n. But we also get here an l, and l is, is, is itself the, the the network depth, as you know, it's also increasing to to infinity. So we get also the the, the l in here. Um, which also shows that if we make the network very deep, then we get also a large, uh, larger um, term in here, and that is then not optimal anymore. So, so you might wonder, couldn't we also not, now it was the L was taken to be log n, and this result could we also maybe make the the L to be to be n or or, or square root of n or something like this? Then the result would show that the or the upper bound would give you suboptimal rates. Actually, we have a bit uh, a more refined version of the whole framework. This is some of the most basic thing you can imagine. But we, since we also have these these delta ends and we have lower bounds, and so so we we, we have uh, a bit uh, worked a bit bit in, in more detail on these things. But roughly, this is the this is the idea. Um, one thing which is very nice about this result that you can from the statistical estimation rates that we have proved, you can get a, an approximation theoretical result that has been proven, have been proved by, by other people before in, a, in essentially the same version, but with a different, completely different proof technique. Okay, so and, and if you have the statistical risk bounds, that just follows as a corollary of the, of the bounds. And l let me explain that in, in a bit more detail. So, um, you you wonder how many how many active how many non-zero network parameters do you need in order to approximate a beta smooth function f zero um, up to say approximation error epsilon and say uh, sub norm. Okay, so and now you 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 ask that uniformly. So um, the, the the worst beta smooth function. Um, how well can I approximate that with an S sparse network? And the result here is that if the sparsity is smaller than this, this quantity, which depends on the accuracy epsilon uh, and also on the depth, if, if that holds, then we have that uh, the approximation error has always to be larger than or equal, equal epsilon. And that is just uh, about how well can you approximate um, uh, Hölder functions with, with, with networks that not, has nothing to do with statistics. So why do we get it out of the statistical analysis? 
Well, we get it out of this, the, the Oracle inequality here because suppose that would not be so suppose that would not be true. Suppose you could you could even do better than than that. Yeah. So it's by contradiction, then you stick that into in in this in the in the upper bound, and then you get a rate here. You get a rate for the prediction error that is faster than the minimax estimation rate. Okay. So you know that that cannot be true. So no method can be better than the the, the best method, um, and that has to, that is a contradiction. And because it's a contradiction, so that the, 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 the thing you started with must be wrong, so, so then this is, this is true. Okay, so it's just an argument you can do maybe in, in two or three, three lines. Um, and it's, it's nice to see that, that, that you can also use the statistical results for other results because it's a completely different way of, of proving than the, these sorts of results uh, compared to the, to the uh, previous uh, uh, results. Um, so I also want to mention to, to close the, the thing about these um, risk bounds. Um, uh, since I have finished this article, there were two more articles uh, or preprints that I somehow take that maybe a step further. And one of these results is by um, people from, from Tokyo and they study um, the, the case where the underlying regression function is a piecewise smooth function. Okay, so, so you have a, a decomposition of your of your space, and then on, on each of or a partition on, on each of these parts, um, you know that the the the, the 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 function the regression function is has a certain smoothness, and you also make an assumption on the, the smoothness of the boundaries. Okay, so and then the rate. That's something we know already since the 90s. The, the minimax rates, they will depend. As it's an interplay between the smoothness of the boundary and the smoothness of the, the, the function on the individual pieces. And uh, what they find is that you, with these deep neural networks, you can achieve these, the, 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 optimal, the, the optimal estimation, estimation range. It's, again, a similar construction with the, with the sparse uh, deep network. Uh, another result which or, uh, was put on the RKF in late uh, 2018, maybe in December or November, I don't remember, it's where you extend your results to, to binary classification with the hinge loss. Um, and here again they, they show that under classical assumptions like our Tsubakov's margin condition, you can achieve the, the, the optimal uh, rates of convergence, but they also consider one case actually where the the rate of the, the the neural network estimator is not yet completely optimal, and that relies that that comes from the I guess that comes from the approximation theory. And, but I believe it's just a, an issue of the the proving technique. It's probably not uh, this. I, I don't see that there's yet a limitation of the of the neural networks that they cannot do that. But it has to be. That has to be clarified. Um, okay, so there, and, and I think more results are coming here. So, so what I hear from other people that they mm, yeah, work on many other setups that, that one could do in order to extend these, these results to other uh, regression models or regression type models like classification. Um, now, I want to come to a different topic. Okay, so that is something I've been wondering a lot is now what people do. In, is, is always comparing deep networks versus shallow networks. And then I think, I, I, I hope I convince you to a certain extent that the shallow networks are not so great. So, so they're a bit like the Fourier series estimators. They're not, there's not much more in the, in the shallow networks. Now, therefore, this deep versus shallow is a bit uh, 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 yeah, an unfair game because you compare to something which is not a, a great thing. So what you rather want to do is, of course, you want to, to compare to other state-of-the-art methods. Um, and in statistics, we believe wavelets are good for everything. Okay, So whatever problem you have, you have normally a, a wavelet analysis gives you a good decomposition of the underlying problem. And then you get uh, good rates, near optimal rates for a huge number of, of problems. Okay, So the, the same question you can ask now for, for this uh, model that we have been considering with the with the composition 
uh, assumption on the on the regression function, what is the rate that a, a wavelet estimator would 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 achieve? Um, and you can just look at a very simple uh, um, composition constraint, which is just a, yeah you can see it either, either as a, a specific form of the generalized additive regression model, or you see it as a specific case of the single index model. But we are interested in estimation of the of the f. Okay, so you can write it as a composition of g1 with g0, and the g0 just sums, and the g1 is a one-dimensional a univariate function. Let's say the the the, the, the function h has uh, the, the smoothness alpha. Now, if you just, as in this example on, on additive models, if you just stick in all this um, uh, ti's and, and beta i stars and so on, you get the, the rate for a deep neural network estimator is n to the minus alpha over 2 alpha plus 1 times log to the power 3. Okay, so forget about the logs. So it's n to the minus alpha over 2 alpha plus 1. Uh, and here we take the square root of, so, so if you take the square root, prediction error, you, you get maybe n to the minus 2 alpha over 2 alpha plus 1. But if you compare it to the, to the wavelet thresholding estimator, you see that the wavelet thresholding estimator has, we, we can prove a lower bound for the wavelet thresholding estimator. And that's a, what does that mean somehow? It means that you just choose a subset of your, of your wavelet coefficients and you, 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 you put them to zero, right? And that, that's normally the way to, to get good rates. But here we can show that however you, you choose the subset, um, you will get a, a lower bound of the, 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 the wavelet. Um, and the, the lower bound is n to the minus alpha over 2 alpha plus d. And the d is the, the terrible thing, right? So this is the discourse of dimensionality, which can make the, the rate very, very small for large, for large d. So, so what's the thing with the... Uh, uh, what's the, the issue here with the wavelet estimators? Why don't they perform uh, well uh, and, and, and get uh, close to the optimal rates? The, the thing is that the, the low dimensional structure here in this function f, this is somehow hidden behind this, the, the nonlinear function h. Okay, so, so w any method that wants to take advantage of this low dimensional structure, that, that this is just a, a sum of the axes here, has somehow needs to look, be able to look inside this function h, okay? And the, the, the thing is with these, if you just make a, a basis expansion and you look at a, a basis, um, then you, you cannot do that, right? So you just look at the, the coefficients of, of, of the, the, the h applied to this function and these coefficients, they behave like the coefficients of a d-dimensional function without any specific structure. Okay, so the, 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 the decay of the wavelet is completely driven by the decay of a d-dimensional function. You can give upper and lower bounds. For sp you can construct specific functions h where you can get very good control on the wavelet decay. Okay, and since you have this very good control on the wavelet decay, you can then uh, somehow uh, de derive the, this, the, the, this result. Um, now you can say, okay, this is naive. I, um, I, of course, if I take such a function and I take a wavelet, so maybe I should change my method. I should first start to estimate h and then try to invert it and so. Maybe you can do that. Maybe you can modify the wavelet estimator. But what is the advantage of the, the deep neural network is you don't need to know any really a lot about this composition structure, right? You, you just need to know that there is a, a certain, uh, or let, let me phrase it differently. If there is a composition, uh, is, if there's a, a representation of the function as a composition, then the deep network will, will perform well and will not need to know how the, the composition looks like, okay? And in this case, if you want to modify the classical wavelet estimator, you would have always, I think you always would need to know how many items do you have in your composition and what are the dimensions maybe in order that you can try to invert all these, all these steps. Okay, so that is not adaptive essentially to the, to the composition structure. Um, okay, so this is about, about the wavelets and you can see the deep networks there, they're, they're getting a faster rate in this case. Now another thing I have been wondering a lot is the, 
the, the MARS, the, the multivariate adaptive regression spline, that's a very popular method in statistical learning. And it has, it's also, it's in a sense, it's similar to, to the networks because it, uh, it's based essentially on piecewise uh, linear functions as the value networks. It has something like depth and width type parameters. Um, and so it's a very natural object why now to compare that with the, with the deep networks, right? The functions classes, underlying function classes are a bit similar. Now, which method is, is better and which one is worse? Uh, the issue with, with that is it's very hard to, to, to obtain risk bounds from, from Mars. Okay, so it's a greedy method, a bit related to what we discussed, the greedy method for shallow networks, which I discussed um, in, in lecture two, I believe, where you just, in each step you make a, you, you, you have built already a set of functions and you somehow you add a new function. In this case, adding a new function is more like you add a new factor into these, into these basis functions that, that minimizes the, 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 the least squares uh, loss. Um, and then you use these, so, so during this uh, Mars procedure, you, you build such basis functions and then later you expand your signal with respect to, 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 to this function system that you have built. Um, and because you can either, in, in, in a step, you can either take an existing function in your space and you add a, another uh, product of this form, or you can start a new function so, so you can either go a bit deeper or you can go wider. And so, 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 so there are many similarities actually with the, with the deep network. So, so the question I asked to, to, to my postdoc is, so yeah, so what is now the, what's, how can we analyze the, the difference between these methods? I want to know what is now, when, yeah, something, maybe one problem where the Mars works well and the deep networks not or the other way around. Um, and so some, the, because we cannot really evaluate uh, the statistical risk of the, of the, of the Mars, um, we only can essentially analyze the, the underlying function spaces, okay? So and you can look what are the function spaces generated by Mars functions, and then you can look, compare them to the function spaces generated by the deep neural networks. And then we, we can prove something. Um, namely, that a function that can be represented by S parameters with respect to this mass function system, right? The mass function system is generated by these, by multiplying these piecewise, these, 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 these value functions, if you like, okay? And suppose you can generate, uh, you, you can represent a function with S parameters in, in this mass function system, then you can show that uh, with a deep neural network, you can you can represent the same function up to a subnorm error epsilon, and for that you need s times log one over epsilon many parameters. Okay, so that means you have to inflate, you have to inflate the number of parameters by something which grows with a logarithmic factor in the in the precision that you want to achieve in order to approximate the the, the, the rate. Okay, and normally if we think about estimation, then we want to achieve a approximation error, which is um, maybe a polynomial in the sample size. So that means we get, uh, we get an inflation of the number of parameters by, by a polynomial factor in the sample size. Okay, so we need to pay a bit more for the, for the deep neural networks. Um, but we can also do it, uh, we can ask, also ask the other way around, how many parameters do we need for a mass function to, to approximate our of a, a deep neural network function. And here, the, the situation is, is much worse. So you can, you can construct, for instance, this very simple function. Okay, so it's just x1 plus x2 minus one, and then the, 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 the positive part of that. And that is a function that you, even with a shallow network, you can implement that with, I, I believe, four parameters or so. But if you take the, the Mars function system, and you want to get epsilon close and, and subnorm distance, you need something like one over square root of epsilon many parameters, okay? And that is a completely different order, okay? So you need, you have a fixed number of parameters for the, for the deep neural networks or for the networks, and you have uh, somehow, if you want to get, say, again with the close, uh, the epsilon, and for, for approximation, you need something like being 
close with epsilon being a, a, a n to the minus something. So then you need also a polynomial order of parameters um, for the for the Mars system, whereas you for the deep neural networks you just need a, 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 a fixed number of of um, parameters. So so in the sense you see that there are certain functions which can be really well represented by the by the neural networks and they're really really hard to uh, to approximate by by Mars functions. And here's the just the, the simulation that we have done. So of course the neural network is so easy that it can perfectly reconstruct them. And this is the reconstruction then by the Mars function. It really has problems with this with this kink uh, here. Um, and then you can wonder now what do we learn? Okay, so this is one function. So what, what do we learn now about these methods? And the, 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 the thing is a bit the, the way these Mars functions are built and uh, maybe when, when they were invented, people had also something different in mind. So they're really built on, on again, on multiplication with respect to different directions. Okay, so that means if your axis, if your, uh, um, if your design, if, if the uh, components or the, the, the single covariates, if they're independent of each other, then this is a great idea to do, I think. So, so you can they have essentially a sort of structure of, of that that's what you can expect. But if there's sort of correlation, um, then they, the, this function system has a lot of problems to pick up the structure. And that is what you see here somehow if you, yeah, so, so the output is something like you have to take x1 plus x2 and then minus one and then something nonlinear afterwards. That is very, very hard to approximate with these, with these tensorization functions. But the other way is, is simple. So if, because we know how to do multiplication efficiently, that's what we discussed last last week. We also know how to how to approximate a product with a deep neural network, and that that leads to this to, to this uh, inflation here. Okay, yeah. Um, now, finally, in the last uh, ten minutes of my talk, I just want to say something about the energy landscape. So you see that. And the and the results, you see that um, the, the 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 thing is this delta n, right? And the delta n tells you something about how close do you get with your method, how close do you get to the global minimum? And if you get close, you 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 you're good. That's what the, the result is. But if you're far away, the, the the network will not perform well. So so you want to get a bit of an idea on how close. So suppose you. A gradient method will maybe get stuck into a local minimum or so, and now you want to to, to have a, a handle on how far are these local minima away from the global minimum in order that you can say something about what is delta n in practice. Okay, so is it now driven by the statistical error or is it driven by the delta n? That's the question you want to ask. And so what you want to study then is this this energy landscape. Okay, so you look at the loss in dependence on the parameter, okay? So for every parameter you get a, you, you fix your data, and then for every parameter you get a, a loss, and the global minimum is the empirical risk minimizer, it's maybe at this point here, but then the energy landscape can look very rough, and that is what happens for the deep neural networks, okay? So and you want to say something about, okay, so those are local minima, you want to say more or less I, I, how close these local minima are in, in terms of the, the the, the achieved loss, how close are they with respect to the global minimum. Um, and there are many things that can happen in these energy landscapes that are of interest. Of course, they can also, also have maxima, but we're not really interested in that. Uh, they can have local minima, they can have global minima. Um, normally, they, because of this way that you per can parameterize one function in many different ways, there's not a unique global minimum. Um, uh, many, uh, it's a whole space of global minima. Uh, another thing is, uh, yeah, you can have a settle point which are neither minima nor maxima. And uh, you can also have so-called bad settle points. Those are settle points where also the, the Hessian um, uh, is, is zero. Okay, so th that means they're quite, quite flat. Um, okay, so and here's a Here's a very the simplest thing I could imagine just to, to illustrate uh, the idea. So what, what we learn in the first statistics course is of course how to do linear regression with one 
So just slope, no, no intercept, okay? So you have one parameter beta here, but now what you do is you take this beta and you over-parameterize it in the sense that you write beta as, two, as a product of two parameters, a times b. There's no good reason to do that, um, but this is exactly what happens. Is it, it, you can see it as a very simple network where you have linear activation function, okay? So what, what happens then? Now the energy landscape is just the, the function that, that uh, looks at, for every a, b, what is the, what is the, the loss? Now I have, plot, uh, and I have plotted this for you, how does this energy landscape look like? And you, this, is the, this is the shape of the energy landscape. So you see it has these two, uh, the local minima in here, so they're like a hyperbola because if A times B is the least squares estimate, that's the global minimum, you have a, local mini, a global minima here and a global minima in there. But in here in the middle, you see that there's a, that there's a subtle point. Okay, maybe it's not the, um, the best plot, but you, I hope you can see there it goes up and then it goes down afterwards and here it goes down and then it goes up. So that, and, and there is also a subtle point for A equals B equals zero here. You can easily check that. Um, so that means by just, if we would have just taken beta here, one parameter, instead of doing this weird uh, product, there would be no settled points, as say, right? So that would be a perfectly convex problem. And everything would be great. But by doing this over parameterization, we suddenly get to see these these settled points coming up. Okay. So what what is good about this is it, at least it doesn't have a local minimum, right? This, the, those are really the the, the the worst thing to for for the energy landscape. But it's, it's it becomes more non-trivial in a sense. Now what you also could do is you could you could do this. Okay, so one step more, you could, instead of a, b, you can write the, the f as over parameterize it and say I'm, the function is a times b times c times x and a and b and c are, are real valued parameters. Now what you can show is that a times b equals c, it's a settled point, but then if you do the math, you can easily check also that it's a bad settled point, so also the, the second uh, derivative vanishes. Okay, so you, you get very, very flat uh, by doing that to, uh, uh, and, at, at that point. And that is already a, a special case of this more general result by, by Kawaguchi. So what he did is he looked at uh, functions um, that can be written as a neural network with um, linear activation functions. So you, if, if it's linear, it just doesn't play a role anymore, right? So it's just um, multiplication of, of matrices, and it's just a generalization of that. And what he, what he shows is that every local minimum is a global minimum, which is a great thing. Okay, so there are no, no bad local minima. But then there are settled points exist, and this is something which we already have seen in, in this uh, simple case, right? This is a special case of this setup. And if you have L larger than one, which corresponds somehow to this setup, you, you, you also can have bad settled points. It's just a um, um, and uh, so, so how does he prove that? He proves that with using uh, local perturbation ar around points. So for the value activation function, if we go from linear activation to, to, to nonlinear activation, uh, it change, everything changes. So, so this result is not, um, um, that doesn't hold anymore. And you, we can have many, many local local minima, which are not global minima. Okay, so here's an example, simplest example I could imagine again, uh, is that you can have one unit, one value unit, it's a shallow network with one, with one unit, and the, you, you see the loss, I think I've been talking about this before, the loss is really driven by, by, the, by the least squares distance with respect to the data. Okay, so um, it computes the, 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 the only, like, all what matters is how the function looks like where the data are, okay? It doesn't, outside of the support of the data, it doesn't mean anything anymore for the, for the loss that you use in order to minimize the gradient. So if you have put your kink outside of the, of the support of the data, if you now, right, so if you change these parameters a little bit, you wiggle around these A and Bs, then you, you just, you don't change the, the, the function in, in, in where the data are, so the gradient is zero, okay? So that gives you a local, a local minimum. There's no way to, um, yeah, so, and, and that's a very bad local minimum because 
uh, there could be you could have of course a much better fit um, here with one even one one unit you could much better uh, approximate your your data okay so you can uh, play this game you you can also see that this happens a lot in practice so we have made simple experiments and we see that a lot of these activated or sorry after the initialization already a lot of these these units they never correspond to to the gradient okay so they will be over zero so they're dead from the beginning onward and then you, yeah so you cannot do anything more so you cannot shift them anymore into the into the support of the data so they're just inactive throughout the the, 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 the learning and what is really important and you see that in this plot as well is that the, the initialization is very important okay so you, you have to have somehow the a, a good fit uh, or with, with, the, with the support of the data in order that you avoid, avoid this, this phenomena. Yeah, I'm slow. I'm, I think, almost out of time. Um, okay, so, okay, two, two more minutes and then, then I stop. Another thing I just want to mention is a, a very basic result. And that has to do with the fact that, uh, yeah, the, can you make the, the training error zero? Okay, so the, the most basic result is that for a continuous activation function, which is not a polynomial, if you have n data points and the, the design points, they're not all the same, or they're, they're all different, sorry, they're all different. In this case, even a shallow network can perfectly interpolate n data points. So it's a non-trivial result if you write it down, right? It's not so clear. And it's essentially you can uh, trace this problem, you can trace it back to the universal approximation theorem, and therefore you have exactly the same type of condition that we had before uh, for, for the universal approximation theorem to hold, if you remember the lecture too. Um, okay, so that means somehow the, in principle, if you have n data points, the shallow networks are, you, um, so if you have n parameters, uh, no, if you have n hidden unit, n units in the hidden layer, then the, then the, 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 the shallow network can perfectly interpolate. Um, and then people, what people now claim is something like in deep learning, zero training error uh, generalizes well. And I think this, those are very dangerous claims because they, 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 they claim a very, something very universal. And I think it's, it's not true. And this, this is also maybe one of the open problems. It really depends on the underlying problem. So if you have these, the, the problems that we have been discussing, I even can show in some simple situations it's not it's not really true, okay? I have to make some assumptions, but this is not really the, not true. This has, I've, I think it has to do with the fact that uh, these major applications, they have a sort of interpolation, uh, there are sort of interpolation problems with very little noise, and then interpolation might be in, in, indeed a, a, a good idea. But for additive noise models and the ones we look in statistics, uh, this, is not a, this is probably not a, the, the, a true statement. And now, I, yeah, so, so and what are the known results for Renison training errors? There are some results um, which were uploaded on ARCAF in, in November last year. Uh, one is by Du and Jason Lee and co authors, and they consider a highly over parameterized setting um, where each unit um, has to be a polynomial order in the sample size. It's a bit the same what we also had in the in, in our result, right, if you remember the, the estimation risk result, there was also the, the width is a, a polynomial order in the sample size, but here I think it's unspecified, so there's no, no good bound for that. And what they also have to assume is smooth activation function, okay, so it's uh, infinitely often differentiable. And then they consider least squares uh, loss, and then they can show that uh, with a certain random initialization, the uh, gradient descent will converge, they can prove that this will converge to have training error zero. There's a related result that uploaded around the same time by Alan Zhu, um, which is for ReLU networks, and that shows that if you have the, if the network with gates at least with the, the n to the power 30 or so, and the other dependencies which I don't list here, then you also get training error zero, with, uh, the, the, and, and you can prove that, okay? so. It's extremely over-parameterized, right? We, we know from the, from the theoretical result, essentially a shallow network, if you have n units, you should have, in principle, the training error is somewhere zero, right? You can interpolate the data. And here what they need is something like n to the power 30 in each of these layers. So that means it generates a huge space of parameter configurations that have training error zero. 
and I think there's a there's also a lot of, of room for, for improvement in these in these results. Okay, so this is now my, my final slide, and then I stop. I think it's a huge, a very exciting field, and many many things that have to be discovered. It's really just at the at the start of the of the field. I just want to mention uh, here four things that I believe are uh, of, of a lot of interest. So so one is uh, classification. Uh, all these setups with a lot of like the multi-class classification with a lot of classes exactly try to model the setup they, they are using with the cross entropy loss. Um, we haven't been looking, for instance, at all at the, the high dimensional inputs where when, right in, in practice, if you take the, the images, then every pixel is, a, is an input and that somehow the right way to model it in a statistical framework would also to be to let the the, the, the dimension to grow with, with, with the sample size, right? So, so now the dimension is always fixed. And I think a lot of effects will, will occur in this case as well. And manifold learning, uh, lots of things to study about the properties of the energy landscapes, how the local minima and the settled points relate to the global minimum. Something which hasn't been studied at almost, I mean, there are very, very few results. Um, all these network structures that really lead to these impressive results on image classifications are these convolutional neural networks that have a completely different structure than or as what I mentioned in the first lecture, the, the recurrent neural networks, uh, there's autoencoders, it's a sort of nonlinear form of the, of the principal component analysis, um, has also not been studied at all. I think there's a huge playground of, for extensions and, and different structures that can be analyzed. Uh, and finally, the, 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 the GANs, also a big area where, where there have been now some first works where I didn't have time to talk about that, since it's also a bit not, not, ent not too, it, it's related to the neural network because it's used for that, but um, it has also a bit of different flavor and this is now a huge topic in machine learning as well. And there's also very, very little theory at, at this moment. Okay, so. Thank you for listening to these lectures. I hope it wasn't boring. If you want to talk to me, I'm here today and tomorrow. And thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. OK, uh, I think uh, for the interest of time, it's already 9.30. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, thanking, uh, thank you, Professor Shinichi, for the excellent uh, lecture series. Uh, maybe let's thank him again. If you have any questions, ask him afterwards. Let's yeah. thank him again. Okay. Yeah.